Christine. It's good to have you here. You guys are a good looking bunch. Uh, it's so glad to, good to have you here, Columbia Center for the Arts and Hood River, and also tuning in on the live stream and coming in right now. There are seats right here. We won't charge you for the late fee. Um, <laughs> My name is Sarah Fox. I'm the host and curator of Sense of Place. Like I said, we're in our 14th season, which I'm very proud of. And tonight, we are going to be hearing about salmon at a crossroads. Salmon and dams. Dams and salmon. Have you guys heard this one before? <laughs> this story is an old one, and it has been around. And so some of you may have been thinking, what, I mean, what's new here? If you've been paying attention, though, there is a lot going on right now that may point to an unprecedented time in this story and some really unique changes ahead. Um, some of you may have noticed not long ago when a Republican congressman in Idaho started calling for dam removal and coming up with a plan. Some of you may have noticed um, this September a presidential memorandum. Some of you may have noticed just this past month in December, an agreement between the Biden administration and the six sovereigns, it's the four treaty tribes in Oregon and Washington. Yeah. All of that was because they knew I'd book this for January. <laughs> it's very nice of them. Um, so I feel very fortunate that we have Miles here tonight, <laughs> given the timing, but also given his expertise to help dig into this story because I do think that this is a time when there may be some, some unique changes going on and we're lucky to have someone in our community who can talk about it. But before we get to Miles, will you guys help me thank our amazing, amazing sponsors? We have the best. And that includes many of you. Um, and it also includes all of you who tonight paid for tickets, all of you tuning in on the live stream who were able to donate money to help support myself, the program, our speakers, our AV team, our front of house team. It means a lot. Um, I also want to recognize Mount Adams Institute. As many of you know, Sense of Place is a program of Mount Adams Institute. They are a local nonprofit doing work on a national level, and they share our value in helping people connect to this natural world in many different ways. So we're gonna hear from Miles, just a little bit of logistics. We're gonna hear from Miles, and then afterwards we'll have some time for Q&A. So as things come up, keep track of those questions. I love running around and hearing what you guys have on your mind and what you wanna hear more, more about. Um, and now I wanna go back to salmon and dams. Because I was thinking as we were coming in tonight, and I was like, man, we've heard this story so much, right? You know, so we gotta make sure I hit on why it's unique right now. But then I also got a text this morning from a family member who was forwarding a story about the Klamath dams and salmon. And he goes, I didn't even know that was a thing. And I forget sometimes until I leave this place that salmon and dams do not hold the complexities to the rest of the country as they do for us here in the Pacific Northwest. And they are not shaping the country in the same way as they are shaping this place. And so I think it's really important that we hold that in mind tonight and maybe take a moment to reflect on it. Because I know when I go elsewhere, I have people asking, why are you guys talking so much about a fish? I mean, really think about it. If you are not aware of the history and the complexities, if the word salmon doesn't bring up tribal history, Endangered Species Act, litigation, just their cool cycle of life, you may think we're a bunch of nut jobs out here to continue to talk. There's the salmon again, and millions and billions of dollars for salmon. And the same goes for dams, you know? Maybe they're green energy. Maybe they killed saliva. Maybe they help you irrigate or navigate or keep your property from flooding. Maybe they started a fish war. Maybe they helped end a war. Maybe they are all of that. And so tonight, <laughs> 
regardless where you stand on what you think when you hear the word salmon, or what you think of when you hear the word dams, I think it's so important that we're going to learn more about the story, add some more into it, and try to hold all those different pieces in place in our minds because it truly is what gives us here in the gorge and the Pacific Northwest a really unique sense of place in this country. So now, Mr. Miles. <laughs> I had to go to Miles' boss, Lauren, so I can get a little bit more of a bio because he was not giving me a lot of information because I don't think that's his style. So thank you to Executive Director Lauren Goldberg for helping fill me in a little bit here. Uh, Miles has been with Columbia Riverkeeper since 2012. He's currently the legal director. Um, and in that role, he's prosecuted some pretty high profile cases um, to protect our clean water, to protect our salmon, to protect the climate. Um, he's also part of Columbia Riverkeeper's multi-year campaign to stop the world's largest fracked gassed methanol refinery, which was proposed in the Columbia River estuary. So needless to say, his work has been noticed. This is the part he wouldn't have told me. By the New York Times, by CNN, by the Seattle Times, obviously by many, many regional outlets. And depending on where you stand, Miles is likely either your superhero or a hated adversary. <laughs> um, I think what's important, especially in a topic like this where it is so easy to make it black and white and us and them, is to also get to know a little bit of the human behind the profile. And, I, and what I learned about Miles was that he grew up in Newport. He grew up fishing. His father was also a fisherman as well. So he grew up in a place where fishing was not only a staple of the local economy, but also a staple of their identity. And so he is still fishing himself and fishing with his children. Um, he's also an avid fiddle player, but I didn't quite get him to bring it tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> Stay tuned. Um, and tonight he is going to take this complex issue, have it all make sense, and you will leave with no questions, no doubt, and no nuance, right? <laughs> I'm very excited to have Miles Johnson. Please help me welcome him to Sense of Place, season 14. Thank you. I've got... Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Sarah. I, I really appreciate it. And, and thank you to everyone for being here tonight, for rearranging your schedules and digging out your driveways or tuning in on Zoom. Um, yeah, it, it means a lot. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that Hood River, the place where we're standing, is, you know, it's the traditional land the, of the Wasco people, the Wishram people peoples who were removed to the Warm, the Warm Springs Reservation, to the Yakima Reservation, and, and many other peoples. And, and those folks are, you know, they have been the stewards of our, of salmon in the Columbia since time immemorial. And, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll do my best to explain how they remain very much at the forefront of, um, of efforts to to reestablish sustainable fisheries in the Columbia River today. So um, I want to I want to lead off with a with a couple of numbers. I promise not too much math, not too much statistics. But in 2015, 96% of the sockeye salmon that we're trying to return up the Snake River to spawn in central Idaho died. The river became too hot because of the dam. In 2021, 70% of the Snake River sockeye salmon died in hot water before they could return to spawn in Idaho. In 2023, 80% of the Snake River sockeye died in hot water before they could make it back upstream past the dam. And if you're sitting here thinking, oh, well, 
killing 70 or 80 or 90 percent of the breeding population of endangered species every year you know that sounds like a recipe for extinction well i would agree with you and you know one more number just to stick in your head um last year federal scientists that study snake river sockeye salmon predicted that their survival rates will decline by 80 percent in the coming decades because of what the dams and climate change are doing to temperatures in the river. So as bad as things are now, they're going to get worse. We're going to lose, we're going to start losing populations of fish in the Snake River Basin. Sockeye, Spring Chinook, Steelhead. These, these fish that tie the ecosystem together, that tie a region together, that have you know sustained human life in the Columbia Basin for 15,000 years or more, they could be gone in the next two or three decades. Um, so one of the things that I want you to go home with is the idea that there is a real urgency here. Things are, things are bad, especially in the Snake River Basin. The other thing that, <laughs> that I want to stress, and it's kind of counterintuitive, is that there is a different path we could take, and right now we have the opportunity to take it. Um, that's not always been true, but I think right now we have a real political moment to make a different choice and come to a different outcome that you know not only avoids extinction, but returns some of our fish to, to abundant, to healthy, sustainable fisheries. So a as Sarah said, my name is Miles Johnson. I'm the legal director for Columbia Riverkeeper. For those of you who don't know, Columbia Riverkeeper is a nonprofit based here in Hood River. Um, we work to make sure that everyone in the Columbia Basin has the opportunity to you know, enjoy clean water, to catch and eat fish without worrying about toxic pollution, and just to enjoy, in general, all the benefits that a clean and healthy river ecosystem provides. Um, as Sarah also mentioned, I grew up on the Oregon coast. Um, my, my dad was a salmon biologist, and so was my mom for, <laughs> for a while. My, my father-in-law was a commercial salmon fisherman. My brother worked on salmon charter boats. Um, <laughs> most of the people... <laughs> that I grew up around were either salmon biologists or salmon fishermen. And I, you know, I say this to, you know, to kind of give you a little bit of background on where I'm coming from, but also because I don't think that's a particularly unique upbringing for someone in the Pacific Northwest. So uh, can I get a quick show of hands? Who, who out there likes to, likes to fish for salmon? Anybody? Oh, yeah, yeah. That was my peeps. Who, who likes to eat salmon? All right. There we go. There we go. Um, who know? <laughs> Thank you. Um, who knows someone who's a commercial salmon fisherman? All right. We're, we're a little bit inland, so there's a few out there. Uh, who doesn't? you know, eat salmon or catch salmon, but just thinks that they're amazing animals, the way that they tie the ecosystem together, the way they migrate, the way they feed orcas and eagles and bears, and just feels better about life knowing that they're out there. All right, all right. Um, so for anybody who, who's in the audience tonight or on Zoom who's thinking, like Sarah mentioned, why do all you people spend so much time arguing about some fish? Um, you know, I think you've just seen the reason. Because, you know, these fish, it's, m it's more than a species. It's the way that, you know, people in the Pacific Northwest, you know, order our lives, think about the seasons, you know, define our culture and our economy. And, you know, really that's not even to mention um, – Sorry, I should have uh, shown that during my introduction, my son Malcolm. Um, you know, that's not even really to mention the cultures that evolved alongside salmon and, and steelhead in the Pacific Northwest who have been living here um, since time immemorial. This is a picture of Celilo Falls. Um, it was just east of the Dalles um, in Oregon. Just, uh, you know, it was 
it's been said it's one of the longest continuously occupied um, places in Western North America. It was a hub of native culture and economy for, you know, 15,000 years or more um, up until, you know, 1960 when the geniuses at the Army Corps decided we'd all be better off if it was a lake. Um, so, you know, I think that's a that's an introduction to why salmon matter so much. And if there are people who are just, you know, new to the area or new to the issue, and I really hope there are, um, you know, I, I hope that gives you a little bit of, uh, you know, just a sense of what salmon mean to people here. Um, so these are spawning sockeye salmon. Um, and a real quick uh, intro to, to, to the salmon life history. Salmon spawn uh, or breed in fresh water. They need cool, uh, cool streams and rivers with clean gravel where they can lay their eggs. Those eggs hatch out, and depending on the species of salmon, uh, the, the baby salmon will spend between you know, a couple of months and a couple of years living in the fresh water. Then they'll migrate downstream to the ocean, sometimes hundreds of miles. Um, the fish that leave the Columbia River, most of them uh, turn north along, um, along the coast of Washington and BC. They wind up in the Gulf of Alaska. Some of them go as far as the coast of Japan. And you know, depending on the species, they'll spend between one and six years out in the ocean growing um, before they find their way back to the Columbia and then back upstream uh, to the streams and rivers where they were born. So if you are a fish whose life depends on making a huge migration through a river system, what is, what is the worst thing that could possibly happen to you? Uh, uh, somebody comes along and builds a bunch of dams in the middle of that river. And starting in about 1930, that's what the federal government did. They built four dams on the lower Columbia. Uh, they built seven dams on the middle Columbia in eastern Washington. And they built four dams on the lower Snake River. Um, and, you know, I think when people think about fish and dams, a lot of the times what we're thinking about is, can a fish get from one side of the dam to the other? And, you know, certainly that is problematic. There are, there, there are real, you know, issues with fish becoming wounded or, you know, experiencing stress trying to get from one side of the dam to another. But I also want to think about, I, I want people to understand what, what these series of dams have done to the ecosystem, the, the river environment that salmon are exposed to. Um, you know, salmon in the Pacific Northwest, they evolved, um, they evolved to migrate in a river that was cold and fast and turbid. It was, f you know, just rushing out of the, out of the Rockies um, down to the coast. The, you know, before the dams, a, a juvenile fish in, you know, could leave Idaho or Canada and be in the ocean in days, sometimes even hours, if the, r if the r river was really ripping. Um, and, and that's how these, these fish evolve. After we put dams in basically every conceivable part of the main stem, Columbia, and Snake River, what we don't have that big, cold, turbid river anymore. What we have is a slow, warm, clear, in some places very wide and shallow river. Um, and now that migration from Idaho or, you know, central Washington takes, you know, weeks or even months for a fish, um, you know, that might only be two inches long to try to swim through all those reservoirs. And those clear, warm, uh, slow reservoirs, the predators of, of baby salmon, you know, invasive species like... Um, like walleye, wa like smallmouth bass, and native predators like gulls, like terns, like sea lions, herons, um, northern pike minnow. You know, all of these, <laughs> all of these predators are way better at catching small fish in warm, clear water than they are in cold, fast, turbid water. And you know, I think the results have been pretty predictable. Um, Certainly, 
some of the dams cut off just cut off huge chunks of uh, of salmon habitat in the Columbia and Snake Basin. The um, Chief Joseph Dam and Grand Coulee Dam basically blocked all fish passage um, to salmon habitat in Canada. That's just gone, and those fish are gone. Um, the Hell's Canyon Dam complex in Idaho blocked all salmon access to the upper Snake River, um, and those those runs are gone too. Of, of the remaining <laughs> of the remaining populations of fish um, in in the Columbia and Snake. 13 of those populations since the early 90s have been listed on the Endangered Species Act. None of them have been delisted. Um, and in the last you know, couple of years, we're starting to see predictions from federal scientists that um, especially populations in the Snake River are headed towards extinction in the next couple of decades unless we make major changes. So the situation is bad. I think it was predictably bad when we started putting in dams everywhere. Um, I do think there is, <laughs> there are some success stories though. There are some reasons to be hopeful about recovery. If you look at uh, the populations of fish that live in the Hanford Reach, Summer Chinook, if you look at the populations of sockeye that live in the Okanagan River um, in Northern Washington in, and Southern British Columbia, you know, those populations of wild fish um, have rebounded and now, now produce, you know, robust runs of wild fish that actually su support sustainable fisheries. And they've rebounded because we've changed the way <laughs> that dams that were affecting their spawning habitat um, operate. We've changed it so that those fish were able to access and spawn, complete their life cycle, um, without too much interference from the hydropower system. And so when that happens, when, when our salmon actually have access to good, to good quality spawning habitat, they can recover. It's not a lost cause. We've seen it happen. And so with that, I want to turn to... Lower Snake River Dam removal. Um, how many of you have been to the Lower Snake River? Show of hands. Oh, good. Uh, been out to any of those dams? It's a yeah. It's kind of an out of the way place here in Eastern Washington. Um, and the Lower Snake River, as we talk about it, uh, is the you know 140 or so miles between the confluence with the Columbia and the Idaho border. Um, there's four dams in that stretch. Those dams do have fish passage. There are, <laughs> so fish do migrate. Um, they migrate up the river, they migrate down the river. Um, there's just, <laughs> it's just not very good. It doesn't work very well. And a lot of the fish that, that have to move past those dams die as a result. What's above the Lower Snake River, I think, is really what's important here. Uh, we have the Clearwater River in Idaho and the Salmon River in Idaho, some rivers in Northeast Oregon as well. Um, and that habitat is the biggest chunk of high quality salmon spawning habitat that remains in the lower 48. It, it is, um, you know, it's relatively undisturbed, relatively undeveloped. It's at higher elevation, so it's a little bit more resilient to the effects of climate change. And yet, <laughs> the salmon runs <laughs> that should be in those rivers are going extinct, even though that is some of the best spawning habitat. Why? because the Snake River dams present too much of a bottleneck. That's just too much mortality. Too many fish die on the way to the ocean and on the way back um, for those populations to recover. But if we could get rid of that bottleneck and get those fish back into that high quality spawning habitat, then I think we have a real chance, as we've seen in other places, to have those, to have those runs of fish rebound. So you know that's why people talk about the need to um, to remove the Lower Snake River dams. That's what, you know, we think will happen um, on, a, on a salmon biology level. Um, so let me talk a bit about the movement for Snake River dams. Um, and I think there's probably people in the audience who are like, Miles, I've been hearing about Snake River dam removal since before you were born. Why? <laughs> 
<laughs> should I listen to you now? Uh, and I think that's a real fair question, and I, and I intend to answer it. But I do want to acknowledge that for, you know, many, many years, uh, the movement for Snake River Dam removal has looked a little bit like this picture. You know, a few very dedicated people kind of screaming into the political void. Um, and that's not a knock on those people. Some of those people, you know, are <laughs> they're my heroes, and, you know, I am a... I'm a sucker for anyone who's willing to speak truth to power, especially when that truth is, uh, you know, unpopular. So it's <laughs> it's not a knock on the people who have kept this drumbeat alive. Um, but it is an acknowledgement that this has been going on a long time without a lot of results. So why is right now the time to pay attention to this? If you've been hearing about Snake River Dam removal for decades, you know, what is different now? Um, because I am a bit of a scientist at heart, um, <laughs> I'd like to think that some advances in science, you know, have a big, have had a big impact on this debate in the last five years. Um, there's always been a kind of general understanding that, you know, putting a bunch of dams in a salmon river is going to be bad for salmon. But there's, you know, there's a lot of things that are bad for salmon. Um, and for a long time, I think it was easy, especially for opponents of Snake River Dam removal, to point at other things like predators or ocean conditions or, you know, this or that. Um, and that, I think, created enough gray area for politicians in the Pacific Northwest to say, you know, we want, of course we want salmon. We want salmon restoration. Salmon are just too important to the people of the Pacific Northwest for us to say anything else. But there's a lot of gray area here, and we don't, you know, we don't want to take this really hard step of Snake River Dam removal unless we're, you know, 100% certain that it's necessary. So in 2017, um, there is a, <laughs> there's a very small federal agency called the Fish Passage Center. Has anybody heard of it? Right. It, believe it or not, there is a federal agency whose only job is to study the impacts of the Columbia and Snake River dams on salmon and steelhead. And for decades, they collected data on salmon migration, how salmon use the river, what kills salmon. They developed a very sophisticated model um, for uh, predicting salmon returns and, you know, sources of mortality. And in 2017, they asked that model a pretty simple question. <laughs> Can we recover Snake River Spring Chinook with these dams in place? And the results of that model were an overwhelming no. They showed pretty unequivocally that <laughs> with the dams in place, Snake River Spring Chinook are not going to recover. But if the dams are gone, they're going to be able to survive their migration well enough um, that the population will begin to rebuild itself. And that was in 2017. I think that was a watershed moment in all of this. Unfortunately, the, the scientist that made that conclusion chose to express it in this very clear and, uh, you know, <laughs> extremely approachable graph. Um, which, uh, yeah, only makes sense if you have had your head way too far inside of all this for way too many years. Um, Maybe this is how you say that as a federal scientist and still keep your job, um, you know, on page 85 of a 900-page annual report. At any rate, you're going to have to trust me that that is what that graph says for, for a moment. Um, but I really do think that this was one of the moments when it started to permeate the scientific discourse and bubble up into the political discourse of the Pacific Northwest. And at the same time as this graph was coming into being, federal scientists and also Columbia Riverkeeper were using temperature modeling to look at the effects of the dams and climate change on, on water temperatures and seeing, you know, 15, 20 years down the road, we're going to be running into major problems if these dams are still in place. We're going to be seeing temperatures that are just not survivable for fish. And so, you know, the 
the collision of of some of that science, um, you know, it, it really closed a lot of the loopholes in arguments that snake river dam removal isn't necessary. Um, I, I think it forced people to grapple with the reality that I, I think most of us understood at a common sense level, but we're just not gonna recover those fish with these dams still in place. And so by 2022, you have people like the American Fisheries Society, who's a, a non-governmental, non-governmental, non-partisan uh, scientific society saying things like, you know, we need to return the Snake River to free flowing conditions. Um, and shortly thereafter, we have the National Marine Fisheries Service, who is the, you know, they are the federal agency in charge of salmon science saying, you know, if we want to restore Snake River salmon to steelhead, we need to get those dams out. Um, I think for a long time there was, there was discourse um, at the scientific and the political level about whether or not Snake River dam removal is necessary. I don't think there is any meaningful debate anymore. You will, you will still find people who want to debate it, but you know you will still find people who want to debate plate tectonics too. So um, sometimes you just got to move on. Um, and that, uh, you know, that level of scientific surety made it a lot more difficult for p progressive um, and, and other politicians in the Pacific Northwest who care about salmon and the people who care about salmon um, to keep ducking this issue. And, you know, I expect you know this, but for the last, you know, three or four decades, Snake River Dam removal has been a third rail in Northwest politics. You just did not talk about it if you were a politician of any stripe. Um, and, in, and in 2020, a, a very unusual person kind of broke that tradition. And that, and that was Congressman Mike Simpson of Idaho. If you don't know who Congressman Mike Simpson is, um, he is a deeply conservative person from a deeply conservative district in a deeply conservative state. He spent most of his political, re political career adamantly opposed to Snake River Dam removal. And he cares deeply about seeing Idaho salmon and steelhead recovery. And by 2020, he saw the writing on the wall and said, you know, we're, we've tried everything else to recover these fish. They need a river. We can do other things, you know, <laughs> with hydropower, with transportation, but we're just not going to get there. Um, <clears throat> we're just not going to get there with these dams in place. And, I, and he really broke the seal. Uh, you know, Earl Blumenauer, our, our congressman here in Hood River, followed him and said, yes, I think this is the right thing to do. That might be the only thing Earl Blumenauer and Mike Simpson have ever agreed on. Um, you know, it followed quickly by Governor Kate Brown, who said, yes, we need, we need to replace the services and we need to get those dams out of here. Um, Governor Inslee in Washington, Senator, um, Senator Murray, spent a lot of time over the last couple of years trying to bring people together and say, you know, look, the, the science is clear what we need to do, and we don't have that much time to do it. We need to get the people who use the river, um, who benefit from the river now, we, ne we need to get them together, you know, make a plan to keep those folks whole as we move towards Snake River Dam removal. Um, you know, the, the other thing <laughs> that is going on, not, you know, all of these things touch each other, of course, um, is the huge um, the huge lift brought to this by um, by tribal people, by tribal leaders, by tribal nations. Um, in the same time, um, and you know, <laughs> likely uh, in the same time that Northwest politicians were coming out in favor of this, the tribes in the Columbia Basin. Uh, really began pushing um, a comprehensive approach to, to salmon recovery and snake river dam removal. And, and I want to be clear that the tribes in the Columbia Basin have always been at the forefront uh, of salmon recovery efforts. That hasn't always meant 
um, that they have been championing Snake River Dam removal. Um, but they are now. I think that's a big reason why some of the, you know, Northwest politicians, in addition to the science, are, are engaged. Um, and I just, you know, I've been lucky to have a front row seat to the advocacy of some of those tribal nations and tribal leaders, um, people like Kian Singer of the Umatilla Youth Council, um, people like Chair Wheeler of Nez Perce Tribe. I, I don't know if anybody made it here for his, uh, his presentation a couple months ago. Um, people like Councilman Jeremy Takala of Yakima Nation, um, former chair of the Umatilla Tribe, uh, Kat Brigham. You know, the tribes are not just leading this in a, you know, in a moral sense, although they're doing that too. Um, the amount of work being poured into this by tribal leaders and their staff is truly astounding to me. You know, when you look, <laughs> just getting a glimpse at some of those folks' schedules, they are, they are on the road. They are going to D.C. They are meeting with people. They are in, you know, endless meetings with agency heads and, you know, basically anyone who will listen to them. And so what you get when the science and the NGO community and political leadership in the Pacific Northwest and the tribes align, you get, you get the attention of a progressive administration. And whatever you think about this dude, um, his <laughs> this is a 501c3. I cannot endorse the blah, 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 blah. Um, so wh whatever you think about him, his administration is filled with people at the highest levels who understand not only the science of Snake River Dam removal, they understand what Snake River Dam removal and salmon mean to the tribes. You know, some of that is because they are tribal people themselves. Um, and so in the, over the past couple of years, I think we've seen um, some very encouraging signs out of the Biden administration. You know, statements from the White House and from, uh, from Joe himself that, you know, we need a durable solution to the issues of salmon and steelhead um, recovery in the Snake River Basin. You know, we understand that that is part of honoring our obligations to, to tribes and tribal people. And, you know, we understand the science about Snake River Dam removal. Um, so we're in this moment where people are talking about Snake River Dam removal again. And not just people like me, but people like him. And, you know, people from the Pacific Northwest, like Senator Murray, Senator Ron Wyden, um, the governors of of Oregon and Washington. That's a great thing. That's a huge amount of momentum. Does it mean anything? <laughs> Is it going to go anywhere? Um, so uh, Sarah mentioned it, but who out there has seen, you know, a, a news a news report or announcement or got hit hit up by Columbia Riverkeeper's email about this new agreement between the tribes and the states and the feds. All right, so seems like seems like it, we're we're getting the message out there. Um, for for everyone else, um, late last year, uh, the the four treaty tribes: Yakima, um, Umatilla, Warm Springs, and Nez Perce. The states of Oregon and Washington, the Biden administration, uh, a bunch of NGOs, including Columbia Riverkeeper, came together and decided to pause this kind of running legal battle that had been going on for 20 years uh, and, you know, take a few years to see if we could come together and come up with some solutions for these problems. Um, and that's really, I think, the heart of that agreement. So. I, I want to get into the details because I'm a lawyer, so I think the details are important. Um, and I think this is going to set the tone for, snake, for the Snake River Dam removal movement over the next couple of years and, um, and really determine whether we're on the right path or whether we're going to slip back into the status quo. 
So I have good news and bad news. Who wants the bad news first? Raise your hand. All right, who wants the good news first? Hmm. Well, I guess I'm a bad news first kind of guy. I've been, I've been accused of, you know, not even getting to the good news sometimes. <laughs> um, but, but I'll do bad news first here because there's less of it and I want to end on a high note. So th the bad news. The bad news about this agreement is that it doesn't guarantee snake or dam removal. Um, I think going in, um, organizations like Columbia Riverkeeper and, and others, and you know, a lot of people watching this unfold from the outside were hoping that we would come out the other end with an agreement that said something like, you know, we're going to do X, Y, Z, and then on year, you know, whatever, we're going to take out the Snake River dams. Unfortunately, this agreement doesn't do that. What it does is say, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and, you know, make a decision in principle about what should happen, and then we're going to go to Congress and have them bless it. <sighs> Not exactly the same thing. Um, the second bit of bad news is that this agreement actually makes certain things worse for salmon in the river. Um, because the Bonneville Power Administration, which is the federal agency that sells the, sells the power from the Snake River dams and the Columbia dams, you know, because they wanted to kind of maintain their ability to sell power at exorbitant rates to California in the middle of the summer so they could make a bunch of money, they insisted on um, curtailing the amount of water that gets spilled over the dams in the summer to help fish migrate. Um, and that's going to have a real negative impact on Fall Chinook in the Columbia and the Snake River. And Fall Chinook in the Columbia and the Snake River aren't that endangered, but they are kind of the last best reliable salmon fishery in the river. And that's a pretty tough pill to swallow. Um, what, el <laughs> what else is wrong with this? It's going to take a long time. You know, even if everything goes right, you know, we're looking at you know, making plans to replace the services, coming to a new agreement or coming to a new decision in principle by the feds, getting the getting Congress to bless it. Like, you know, even rose tinted glasses on, you know, this is, you know, eight or 10 years away from Snake River Dam removal. And that that's a best case scenario. And, th and then I think the final bit of bad news here um, is that many of the people who, or many of the interests that have opposed Snake River Dam removal over the years, you know, they haven't come around to this idea that we can replace the services, you know, we can do things differently and better than they have been in the past. You know, Bonneville Power Administration, the Army Corps, the big public power utilities, the, the barging and transportation companies, uh, some of the agricultural interests, they're just not yet at the table, um, you know, despite some very earnest effort, I think, from folks like um, Senator Murray and the Biden administration. You know, there's just a lot of opposition that remains out there and, you know, frankly, opposition in, in Congress. Um, you know, Senator Mis or <laughs> Representative McMorris Rogers and Newhouse from Eastern Washington, Cliff Bentz from Oregon. You know, these people are not taking this sitting down. Um, so, you know, it's not as though everyone <laughs> is on board and you know we just need to work out the details there's there's remaining opposition so that's enough bad news L let me talk about why you know why we went along with this why we think this is a good idea and you know puts us on a better path than we ever have been before and you know before before I get to the text of the agreement I, I think one of the best things to come out of it was actually how it came together and that was with the leadership of the four Columbia River tribes. Um, you know, the tribes have been advocating for salmon for decades, um, not always all in the same way. Um, and what we saw here was a real coming together of, of tribal nations that all, of course, value salmon at a cultural level, 
but have very different interests um, and approaches. And, you know, over the years, haven't always spoken with one voice. Um, you know, here they managed to come together around a set of priorities for Columbia Basin salmon restoration that includes Snake River Dam removal um, and go to, the <laughs> go to the federal government and the rest of the region and say, look, you know, we may have been, you know, in different places in the past, but now we're all together. And that sends a really powerful message. Um, it's really encouraging for the future of this movement as well. And not only that, after they did that, they were able to go to the governments of Oregon and Washington and say, why don't you join us in that? Um, and <laughs> if anybody has watched the relationship between the tribes and the states in the Pacific Northwest with respect to salmon over the last 50 years, it has not been a smooth ride. Um, there are major differences in approach, in, in theory, um, just, you know, some very, you know, frankly nasty um, stuff as, well, I mean, to be frank, states have tried to limit the ability of tribes to fish and, and help manage their own fisheries. Despite that, um, you know, going into this agreement, we, <laughs> we have the states of Oregon and Washington and the four treaty tribes in the basin all saying, you know, this is our vision for salmon recovery. It includes Snake River Dam removal. And I think that's why we have the attention of the Biden administration. And, you know, whatever happens with this particular agreement, because the path ahead is uncertain, I think the, the convergence of those six entities that call themselves the six sovereigns now, you know, th that can be a, you know, even if, you know, Trump is elected or, whatever, I think that is just an incredibly positive sign um, for the prospects of Snake River Dam removal. So this, the second good thing that I like about this is that it actually says in writing, <laughs> signed by the federal government, if we want to recover Snake, <laughs> Snake River salmon to abundance, we need to remove the lower Snake River dams. And, you know, Understandably, there's probably some people out there rolling their eyes being like, I could have told you that 30 years ago. And that's true, but also, you know, the cliche about the first step to solving a problem is admitting that you have one. Uh, I, I want to be clear that before this, the, <laughs> the federal government's stance on Lower Snake River Dam rule is we don't have a problem. We can, you know, we can recover fish without doing that. We can tweak around the edges. We don't really have obligations under the ESA or to the tribes that would require anything like that. You know, just go away and, you know, we're not going to deal with this. Um, I think this is a foundational shift in that position by the federal government. And, you know, even though it might be an obvious shift, I, I think it's very important. So let's talk about what is in this, um, what's in this agreement. Um, this is an agreement between the states and the tribes and the feds to plan for the removal of the Lower Snake River dams. And, you know, most importantly, to plan for the replacement of those services. Uh, I, I want to be really clear that, you know, neither Columbia Riverkeeper nor any of the tribes nor, nor any of the states nor the Biden administration are interested and just yanking out those dams and saying, huh, I wonder what's going to happen to the rest of the people, you know, in eastern Washington who, you know, have built lives and livelihoods that involve them. Um, you know, that's, ne that's not part of the plan. Um, that's n never really been part of the plan. Um, but now more than ever, you know, there's a real focus on solving, you know, how are we going to do, you know, clean, renewable power replacement? How are we going to help uh, farmers in eastern Washington and northern Idaho get their grain to market, you know, if we don't have this, this barge route? How are we going to ensure that people in eastern Washington can continue to irrigate um, if we change the river level in ways that make their, you know, their current irrigation systems that they've invested, you know, years and, and a lot of money in if they make that, you know, obsolete? Um, so over the next, you know, 
three to four years, there's going to be, uh, you know, a collaborative planning effort led by the feds, but with, with participation by states, tribes, the public, many different entities to, to answer those questions in detail. There's also money in this agreement for the replacement of some of those services, not just planning. And I think most, you know, most exciting and most important, um, that includes a commitment by the federal government to invest in thousands of megawatts of clean renewable energy to be owned by tribes in the Columbia River Basin. Um, you know, that energy could be used to replace the Snake River dams. And I think it's really important that we're investing in, you know, in these sovereign, in sovereign nations who, you know, for the last, you know, 100 years have, have more or less been shut out of, of the energy development space, of the economic growth that can accompany that. And, you know, I would say at best shut out and at worst, you know, victimized um, by the way we produce energy um, and the way we cite energy projects. So I think that's going to be a big fundamental change. Um, you know, the last thing that I want to, to touch on here is the requirement in this agreement for a new policy direction from the federal government. Um, part of this agreement is, you know, and this is kind of some wonky legal stuff, um, but it's a requirement that um, the federal government revisit documents that were issued under the Trump administration that say, basically, we don't have a problem, <laughs> we don't need to do Snake River Dam removal, um, and reissue those documents under the Endangered Species Act, under the National Environmental Policy Act, um, and give new direction uh, to federal agencies. And we, we think and we hope that that, that determination when it comes will say, you know, <laughs> this is the science we need to head in the direction of Snake River Dam removal. So I've been talking for a long time. I really want to get to questions. Um, I, I just want to leave you with the idea that, you know, the, the movement for Snake River Dam removal has real momentum right now. Uh, it's in a far better place than it has ever been, you know, in the past 20 years. On the other hand, uh, I think it's also true that we have a lot of challenges ahead. And we have, you know, there's uncertainty, there's opposition. Um, and despite the fact that I'm kind of a cynical guy by nature, I really do think that salmon mean enough to enough different people in the Pacific Northwest that we can seize on this opportunity and use it and make the kind of changes that we need to see. But we are running out of time to do that. So I'll stop there. Um, thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Joe. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yep, thank you. Aside from casting votes for the progressive candidates, what can we do to help advocate for these removals? Thank you. <laughs> that's your, now you go. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, a lot of the theory behind this agreement is that it is going to set the table for congressional action. And, you know, that is a, <laughs> that's a big if. And if we want it to be meaningful, we need to start working on our, on our congressional delegation right now, or preferably like six months ago. Um, you know, we don't want this to land in their laps in 2026 or 2028 and say, here it is, like, now you go fix it. Between now and then, 
we need to, you know, we need to raise the we need to raise the decibel level on this issue significantly in the Pacific Northwest. We need to show our, you know, the people who will probably be our legislative champions on this, the, the Murrays, the Widens, the Merkleys, um, Cantwell. We need to show them that this is an issue that their constituents care about, and not just that it's important and that we hope they will take action on it, but that we demand action on it. That if they fail to act after you know this kind of historic coalition of people come together and create the solutions and hand it to them on a silver platter, um, that there will be a lot of very unhappy people in their districts. So that's what you know. That's what we need to do between now and then. And you know, there's roles for NGOs, but I think there's also a big role for individual people to get on the phone, to write letters, and say, "Hey, you know, like." I live, you know, in X Y district. I care about this very much. Um, you know, I'm looking to you for leadership to take action. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Um, so I have a question for folks. We started today with a poll, so maybe we actually I'd love, love to ask uh, the audience a question. Um, how many folks in here are served by Pacific Core? Uh, utility in, in the Oregon area or Pacific Power yeah okay and you may not know it's okay <laughs> and then how many of you are served by another utility here in the gorge okay so the reality is your Pacific Core portfolio is about 70% coal and your other utilities in the gorge are about 95% hydro slash nuclear and uh, during this last weather event we had a really strong performance from hydro we had zero wind so just I want to make sure people understand that um, we definitely have an energy transition out there, which is exciting in the future. One of the things for us to be thinking about as a group is what did you see here in the gorge when we had this bad weather experience? We had a lot of semis backed up that could not get through. And how many people have driven the 84 and seen a ton of semis clogging the roads? Do you have a question? Yeah, I do. So I think the important thing is the barges continued to move during this weather event. And I think that was really a powerful thing, that the, the commerce kept going with the barges. My question would be, what do you think about taking a pause on non-tribal fishing? So if you think about taking a pause on non-tribal fishing, we can allow the tribal parties to get more fish into our communities, which helps their tribal communities get more revenue. And we take a pause on the hundreds of thousands of fish that are harvested offshore and inland and elsewhere. Maybe we take a pause and see about the harvest side of the equation. So All anyway, right. also zero wind power during this event. Just want to okay. say that. Thank you so much. So the one thing I'll ask, because I want to hear from as many people as possible, is that we do save statements for later, and you can talk with Miles. Um, so pause on commercial fishing, or non-tribal fishing, excuse me. Likely? R regardless of what I might think about it, it's, <laughs> it's not likely. OK. Um, if I, could I? I have a couple other slides to. I saw those hidden in there. Uh, yeah, Joe, if you get a chance, can you put Miles' slides back up? Do you want to talk, use them for this answer, yeah. or we can go to something else too? Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh shoot. That's okay. Sorry about that. Um, so. This is a graph. Uh, produced by ODFW of, <laughs> of what is killing our spring Chinook in, in the Columbia River. Um, yes, harvest plays a role. Yes, predation plays a role. The problem w with getting fish up and down the river is the dams. There, it's just not comparable, the level of mortality that's coming from other things. I don't think that curtailing other forms of fishing is going to solve our problem. And I don't think we need it to solve the problem. You know, I hear, you know, in your, in your question, in your statement, you know, about the value of hydro. And I, I want to be extremely specific. Um, I want to talk about the power produced by the four lower Snake River dams. 
I, I don't, I'm not trying to talk about the power that's produced by Grant Cooley or, or Bonneville. Um, you know, I think that we can credibly replace that power with sources of clean energy, um, you know, and it's not just building more stuff. It's better transmission. It's battery storage. It's, you know, smart grid technologies that, inc that increase efficiency. You know, all of this stuff is accessible. It's deployable. I think, you know, what we can do is replace the, you know, the real but relatively minor contribution to our energy grid that the lower Snake River dams produce. And, you know, th this is a graph um, of the power produced by all of the dams on the Columbia and Snake River. Um, the, the purple line is demand from BPA customers in the region. Um, and the little blue bars at the bottom are, um, you know, are what the are what the Snake River dams produce. So you can see that throughout most of the year, it's not, you know, it's just not a, a big part of our power mix. But I do want to be clear that during, you know, these are monthly averages. During certain times of the year, you know, a couple weeks in the winter, here, there, things get bad. Yes, like Snake River dams, you know, they do have an important role to play. But we can replace that with something else. We can do something better and we can have our, <laughs> we can have fish returns, we can have, you know, reliable power. Um, you know, this is a solvable problem. Okay. Who else? Miles, do you think that the Klamath River Dam removals is going to have an impact or influence what's going to happen with Snake River just by seeing how successful it might be? Well, I, I, I certainly hope so. Um, you know, I, I want to be clear, there's a lot of differences between uh, this and uh, these dams and, and the dams on the Klamath. The first one and the biggest one is that the dams on the Klamath are privately owned dams, um, you know, regulated by a, a federal agency, but owned um, formerly by Pacific Corps. Um, so there's a there's a different legal context for those dam removals. I think there's also a, a different political and economic context for those dam removals. Um, you know, at some point, Pacific Corps just looked at those dams and looked what it was going to have to do to comply with the Endangered Species Act and restore salmon, and they were like, this doesn't make any sense. Um, it does not appear to me or most other people in the region that the federal government is making that same kind of calculation, frankly. Um, so it's a little bit different context. But nevertheless, I think, you know, the tribal leadership and the, you know, years of activism that led to Klamath Dam removal, it gives me hope. I think it shows people throughout the region that, you know, yes, we can do <laughs> big, complex things. You know, the water issues in the upper Klamath, um, you know, are extremely complex and you know resolving them is every was every bit as hairy you know and it's not complete um, as some of the issues we have in the lower snake so it gives me hope that you know a dedicated group of states and tribes and NGOs can over many decades um, get together and succeed in doing something you know meaningful for fish all right yes Go up in the corner here. Do you guys mind passing that down? Hi, Auden. Hi. Um, will it ever get too cold for salmon? Mm. Thank you. <laughs> um, you grab it. <laughs> that's an interesting question, and I don't want to like, I don't want to over, oversimplify things here. Salmon. When I say salmon need cold water. What I should say is salmon need the type of water that they have evolved to, <laughs> to live in. You know, they need water that's between, generally speaking, 45 and 65 degrees. Um, you know, in some cases, you can, you can find salmon streams or, or places where the water is so cold that it is actually, you know, 
depressing the growth rate of of juvenile salmon. Um, wills, will the Columbia or s main stem snake rivers ever be that cold at times when fish are trying to migrate upstream? Uh, no, they will not. Um, I think you know those rivers are, um, to l in large extent, desert rivers. Uh, once you get into eastern Washington and and Idaho, those rivers have always been, you know, at towards the upper limits of what salmon can handle, um, and the dams um, and climate change are just kind of pushing them, pushing them further towards that, you know just a little bit over into the danger zone, removing some of the complexity that's in, in those waterways with the dams in place. The, the rivers don't cool down at night. There's, there's fewer kind of small pockets of cold water for fish to, to exploit as they move upriver. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is possible to have water that's too cold for salmon. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, that's not gonna be our problem in, in the Snake or the Columbia. Thank you. Okay, a couple more. Go for it. So the, at the beginning of your presentation, you were talking about how the recent scientific data is saying that these runs aren't going to be recoverable based on river flows. Did I, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, so um, I, I think if I, if I remember what you're referencing, you know, there's, there's been an effort um, as we've gotten more sophisticated temperature modeling, but also more sophisticated like bioenergetic modeling mm -hmm. of, of what salmon can need or can withstand and handle. Um, and looking at what the temperatures in the Snake River will be like with dams, with climate change, um, the estimation is that it will be much harder for those fish to survive um, in the future because the water will be even hotter than it is now. Okay. Are there um, recent provisions in the Clean Water Act related to climate change? I, it's a good question. I don't think there have been recent revisions to the, to the text of the act. There's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of awareness by EPA and other agencies, um, National Marine Fishery Service, that, that climate change is going to you know, severely affect our, our freshwater resources. Um, whether that translates into actual policy change <laughs> is, uh, you know, is a different question. Okay. Any more? Any more? Before we go, can you guys pass that back again? Thank you. Hey, Miles, I'll, I'll try to phrase these into questions, but don't you think Please it's do. Yeah. <laughs> don't you think it's important to remember that there are like 65 major dams in the Columbia Snake River Basin, and we're talking about less than 10%? and we're talking about 3% of the Northwest power supply when we talk about the Snake River dams. And don't you think, don't you think that barges can still go to the Tri-Cities and that that means that increased tra traffic on I-84 is not a problem because stuff can barge to the Tri-Cities in Eastern Washington? Oh. So, so w I'm sorry, what's your, yeah. what's your question? It was, aren't those good things to consider? Okay when we talk thank about you. Lower Snake River dams. Okay, thank you. Yes, I agree with you. I think there are, you know, there are real solutions to be had and the, you know, the power that we're talking about is a, is a relatively small piece of the pie in the Pacific Northwest in terms of power production, hydro or otherwise. Yes. Another one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there we go. Good teamwork, guys. There you go. Oh, thanks. Um, Miles, if we go down, uh, you know, two, three, four years from now, and we see that no substantial progress is being made, are there any handles that the tribes or the conservation groups will have uh, to try to kickstart and keep this thing on track? I think it's a good question. Um, you know, the way this agreement is crafted, basically anybody can go back to court at any time um, 
and I think we'll be looking very closely at you know the way that this administration or another administration um, you know implements the agreement and if we get you know, I, I don't think it needs to be three or four years. If we get a clear signal in the next year or two that the federal government doesn't intend to live up to its obligations or what, you know, the tribes and the states have set before it, um, you know, w we can go back to court. And, you know, given the, the short amount of time um, that we have, the, the window to produce meaningful change, you know, I, I think we, we may have to do that. I, I don't really want to go back to court. You know, we've been in court for 20 years. Um, it's produced some some helpful progress, but it hasn't got us where we need to be. Um, but that is still an option. Okay. Uh, oh, oh boy. Okay. It better be real good. <laughs> Miles, I feel like I want to write a letter to someone. Do you have any templates or any uh, email addresses? to help me figure out where I'm going to write this letter to? Uh, do you work for marketing at Riverkeeper? <laughs> that is an excellent question. Really top notch. Um, was there one more over here? Yeah. OK. I'm but feeling really generous. But seriously, you can go to our website. We have resources <laughs> to help you contact I knew it was our coming. elected leaders. So. so Miles, you've touched on how you replace the power, and you've touched on not so much how you replace the transportation. How does the irrigation system work when there are four dams are removed up there? And, w and where is the irrigated area that we're talking about? And if you know how many acres it is, too, that would be interesting to me. Thanks. I, Thank I don't you. know the exact number of acres off the top of my head. Mostly what we're talking about is irrigated orchards um, just east of Tri-Cities. So, you know, the way that these four dams work, uh, it, you know, it's important to remember that they're they're what's called run of the river dams, which means they they're basically always full. They don't store water throughout the season. There's not more water available for irrigate more or less water available for irrigation because the dams are there. Um, but you know, nevertheless, if you're someone who irrigates out of the river, you know, you probably have a pump system or you know, a lot of machinery to lift that water you know, basically through a straw to, <laughs> to where it needs to be on your, um, on your farm. Or, you have, or maybe you have a well that's influenced by the level of those reservoirs. And so when we talk about um, to help, when we talk about helping irrigators remain whole, what, we're not talking about finding more water so much as investing in infrastructure that allows um, you know, those, those farmers to change their, you know, change their pump <laughs> systems, change their, you know, their irrigation systems um, to access the water that you know, is, is still available to them. I hope that was helpful. OK, um, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to think on it while I do some wrap up stuff. Um, a little bit bigger, big picture here. You talked about the six sovereigns and who was at the table for this most recent agreement. The reality is that also there are tribes who are here who will be, who will care very much about this, who were not part of those four treaty tribes. Public power was not at the table. I know that's obviously a point of some frustration. Um, I know you're not privy to who, who and why and all that, but what, I'm, what I do know is that you talked about uh, sort of a critical mass of different perspectives coming together to make this unique moment. And I'm curious what you might say to those people who were not involved in those mes most recent agreement that may give them some hope or at least not make them feel quite as shut out as we move forward because ultimately we will probably need them to be on board too. So think about that. And while he thinks, I'm going to tell you next month, we are going to learn how to grow a pear <laughs> with Leslie Tamura and Adam McCarthy, two of our local multi generational orchardists. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun. It's going to be a conversation. And it just happens to coincide right when the winter pears are ripening. And so I'm twisting some arms to see if we can get some 
fresh winter pears for everyone to try. Um, and we're going to hear more about both of their stories and the history of their families here in the Gorge. Um, I also wanted to say, plug, Sense of Place has a companion podcast called Here in the Gorge. Um, and Here in the Gorge has two stories that I think are relevant to this topic tonight. One is on Woody Guthrie's history here, getting paid by the federal government as a kind of a ragtag, dusty socialist to write songs about why we should build dams. If you don't know that history, it's fascinating. So there's a Woody Guthrie episode. There's also an episode on tribal fishing in the Pacific Northwest. Obviously, it's a tiny bit of a very complex, big story, but you will meet Terry Brigham, who is one of the sisters at the Brigham Fish Market in Cascade Locks, and her mother, Miles represent, or, uh, mentioned, is Kat Brigham, who was, is the former board chair of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, was also a Sense of Place guest last year, so you can also watch um, a Sense of Place from last year. So there's other pieces to fill in the picture. Um, and then the last thing I want to do is thank Joe with Big Britches, who does all our AV and does <laughs> theater <laughs> over in Bingen. <laughs> Thanks to Etta, who does all of our front of house work and makes everything run smoothly. <laughs> Thanks to Kyle, who is usually right here when I do this and he's not here, so I, there you are! All right, so I'm a fish. Fish, is that what you want? I was gonna go with the <laughs> Okay. I always have to do a post for Kyle. Okay, so that is it. I hope you see you next month. And real quick, Miles, what do you have to say? I, I'm supposed to answer that real quick. Real quick, and I want you to wrap it all up and answer all. No, I'm <laughs> no you can go medium no. quick. It, it's a great question, a really important question. You know, I think a lot of the narrative to come out of the opponents of Snake River Dam removal is, you know, we were excluded from this. Um, from this negotiation. And from the very end, I think that's probably true. Um, I want to contextualize that a little bit by saying that this negotiation was something that went on for, you know, at least a year and a half, um, you know, being facilitated by the federal government, bringing all of those interests into the room, um, you know, both privately and in public fora where you know, everyone had an opportunity to be heard. Um, you know, on top of that, you know, this debate has been raging in the Pacific Northwest for 20 years. The idea that, you know, people haven't had a chance to say their piece about it, you know, it's a little bit disingenuous. You know, th that said, I think it's absolutely true um, that we're going to need those folks at the table. And, you know, I really, I really do mean what I said. I think, you know, our leader, you know, our political leaders like Murray, um, like Inslee, um, like Biden, I think they do mean what they say when, when they say we don't want to leave anyone behind. We want to do this differently, yes, but in a way that brings everyone forward together. And I feel like there are people out there who, for understandable reasons, don't believe that. Um, and I guess my ask would be, <laughs> for those interests, for those people, to take a chance to come into the room and do something besides, you know, point at a bunch of, um, you know, different issues and say, what about this, what about that, try to relitigate the science. Instead, to come in and really engage and say, you know, like, this is what we need, this is what we can do, this is how we can solve the problem so that we can remain, you know, not unchanged, but whole. And the people in the Pacific Northwest who have not been whole for a long time because of what these dams have done to salmon, so that they can be whole too. Uh, you know, we're not trying to shut people out. We're trying to be bring people in. Um, and so far, I'd say that despite a lot of important people being on board, there's still a lot of important people not on board. 
And that's gonna have to change if, you know, if we want real progress. I think that's what people like Senator Cantwell and <laughs> Senator Merkley are looking for. You know, they don't want to pick up something that's a food fight. They want to pick up something that people in the Northwest agree on. And I think there's room for that agreement, um, but we need to get, we need to get more people I in the room and, you know, honestly talking about what the issues are and how to resolve them. So, uh, yeah, that's my <laughs> <question>. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Miles. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. I hope to see you guys next month. Good night. <laughs>